following couple of weeks were just filled with tangible miracles. I mean, I had been underwater for 30 minutes. The Bible tells us of an incredible place we can go after death. Our dwelling would be with God himself. He would wipe away every tear from our eyes. There would be no more crying or pain. Skeptical spine surgeon, Dr. Mary Neal, unintentionally went to that place. Mary's story has been featured on Dr. Oz, Oprah Winfrey, NBC News, Fox News, Huffington Post, and so many others. She is the New York Times best-selling author of To Heaven and Back, a doctor's extraordinary account of her death, heaven, angels, and life again, a true story. She's here with us today. Let's hear what she learned and saw and now believes is the biggest and most important truth for every person to know. Mary, thank you for being with us today. Tell us the story of you. We are a life and family show. So tell us your life and family story, bringing you up to the point where you had this experience. One of the things that I think is really wonderful about my experience is that leading up to this, I was uh, an everybody. I mean, I was a child of the 1950s in the Midwest, which means that I was taken to Sunday school and did youth group and confirmation and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, like so many people, um, you know, I mean, church was sort of something you did on Sunday mornings, and then you went back to your real life. And it was very, very different than actually uh, incorporating faith into every moment of every day. And I, I don't get me wrong, I, I try to be a good person. I mean, I certainly bought into the whole idea of being, you know, honest and ethical and a woman of integrity and all that sort of stuff. But that's very different. And then when I went off to college and medical school and did my surgical training, I certainly ascribed to the religion of the intellect. I was smart, I was accomplished, I was self-reliant. I certainly didn't need God. I had my life under control. You know, it's like so many of us uh, believe that. And as a scientist, I at the time believed the false narrative that science and faith can't coexist, which is entirely incorrect. Um, but I just was living my life like so many people. I was married. I had four young children and I had a full time job. <laughs> I was really busy. You know, so many of us think about our families and put them as our top priority. And sure, you know, I took my kids to Sunday school and did that sort of thing. But I don't know. I think that like so many people, when you have a busy family and a busy work and a busy life, we tend to sort of think that we'll think about God sometime in the future. I had not known anyone who died personally. I certainly had been exposed to death through my medical training and patients, but I hadn't known anyone. I hadn't known a grandparent or a parent or a sibling or anyone who died. And so the the idea of death for me was really pretty abstract. You know, as a physician, of course, we're taught really that if we're smart enough and well-trained enough and thoughtful enough that, you know, we can prevent death. Death is our enemy. And I had never thought about really what happens after death. I had abstractly thought that, you know, I hoped something more 
occurred after death, but I'd never really given it much thought. I, I would have said that I was a Christian and that I believed in God. But I think looking back on it, like so many people that I observe in our, our society, at least, I would say really I was a cultural Christian. Um, you know, I, I kind of had it in my back pocket, you know. I mean, back in those days, I mean, prayer, for example, was really praying and asking for outcomes instead of truly desiring only that God's will be done. And those are the, those are very different things. But that's really kind of the the person I was beforehand. And I would have said I was a woman of faith, but not not like afterward. My husband and I went down to Chile to South America to go kayaking. And kayaking is something that we had done for decades. We'd kayaked all around the country. We'd kayaked internationally before. We had friends who are professionals who ran kayak trips to Chile every year. So this was something that was a reasonable thing to do. You know, this wasn't, um, you know, some crazy kind of activity. So we went to Chile and spent a week kayaking and it was wonderful, of course. And on what was going to be our last day anyway, we decided to kayak a section of river that's well known for its waterfalls. And, and I don't mean, you know, crazy waterfalls. I mean, drops of 15 to 20 feet, which for an experienced kayaker is always challenging and exhilarating, but it was well within our skill set. So we started down the river again, these, I was with these friends of ours who are professionals. And then there were a few other American clients and uh, we went over the first few drops and that was fine. And we came to the first sort of more significant drop and decided to uh, go down one of the channels because a waterfall isn't usually just all the way across the river. We decided to go down uh, one of the smaller channels because again, it was still sort of early in the day. And I went into the current to do this. And this river was very high flow, high current, high volume, not a lot of slow areas or eddies where you could sort of regroup or pull over. And there was another American client who had actually uh, sort of wedged herself sideways in the entrance to this drop or the chute. And so my only option was to veer over and go over the main part of the waterfall, which is exactly what I did. And as I crested the top of the waterfall, I could see the bottom and see the tremendous turbulence and hydraulics and no clean exit. And I mean, I won't say what I was really thinking, but I knew that um, I was in for a bit of a, a ride because what I thought would happen is that I would hit the bottom and be flipped upside down and probably exit my boat and be tumbled around a little bit before being spit up downstream. And that's never a fun thing, but it is a little bit part of kayaking. <laughs> and so that's what I was prepared for and that's what I expected. What happened instead is the front of my boat became pinned or stuck in the rocks and the underwater features. And so the boat and I were completely submerged under eight to 10 feet of water. And as you said earlier, man, I'm a spine surgeon. I'm, I'm very cool, calm and collected under high stress situations. So people always ask if I panicked and no, I'm, I'm not a panic sort of person, but I did go about trying to free the boat or free me from the boat. And it became clear that I was uh, pretty well stuck. I knew that I would probably die. And many people would like to think that a sense of peace came over me or, uh, you know, I just gave up. And, and none of that is true. <laughs> and I don't really know how to explain or communicate that this was a very active choice and that I actually did have options. <laughs> but I made the choice to ask that God's will be done. And I know that 
it seems like there are no options, but I always did have an option. And we all have an option to turn toward God or turn away. And I asked that God's will be done. And it was the first time in my life I had actually meant it. <laughs> you know, like so many of us, you know, we say the Lord's Prayer, but we don't really mean it. We want God's will to be done as long as it's, you know, in line with our own. And of course, on our own timetable and that's, you know, that sort of thing. But I absolutely gave up trying to control the outcome and moved into this uh, emotional state of absolute trust and reliance in God's will, regardless of what that meant. And the moment I asked that, I was immediately overcome with a very physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured that everything is fine. My husband would be fine. My young children would be fine, regardless of whether I lived or died. And I knew without any doubt that I was being held by Christ. And it was a bit of a surprise <laughs> because, you know, we all talk about the fact that we don't earn God's love. But the fact is, we don't believe that because on this earth, we learn very quickly that love is conditional and things have to be earned. But God tells us we don't have to earn his love. And it is true. <laughs> and that was the first really wonderful part of this experience. And as I said earlier, I'd never thought about what would happen after death. And I suppose I probably would have imagined the Hollywood version <laughs> but this was nothing I could have imagined. I felt, first of all, like I was this precious, beautiful baby, this beautiful child of God that was being held and comforted and reassured. And Jesus was pouring his very soul into me. It, it was amazing. And it was amazing to know that that would be anyone who asked, not just me. And I was taken through a life review that had nothing to do with judgment and everything to do with understanding and knowledge and grace and true grace. I mean, I truly believe I learned what that means. God's absolute, pure, undeniable, unconditional love for each one of us. And then, you know, I was also... Uh, shown again and again the beauty that came out of every single incident in my life that I had been shown. And these were all the, you know, the really wounding, terrible <laughs> incidents in my life. And it was very profound. And, and I'm a very um, pragmatic, concrete sort of thinking person. And, and I have to say that while this was happening, I was still me. Perhaps I was my better self, but I was still me. I was still analytical and I had sort of a little thought balloon off to the side thinking, wow, this is quite a hallucination. I couldn't, you know, am I still breathing? I mean, how am I experiencing this? And so I would take time to do self-assessment exams and I would think about my breathing and no, I didn't have any air. I would think about the water and I could still feel the pressure and the weight of the water and the current working on my body. And then I could feel my body kind of being sucked over the front deck of the boat. And while that was happening, I could feel my spirit peeling away from my body. And, and eventually my spirit, my soul, my essence, you know, whatever you want to call it, broke free. And I rose up and out of the river and it was as though Jesus sort of released me to the heavens. And it, it was the most wonderful feeling I've ever had. I never had an experience of being, you know, alive and then dead, conscious and then unconscious. I had the experience of being alive and then more alive, dead, or I mean, uh, conscious and then more conscious. And then I, pretty soon I was up and over the river and greeted by a group of, um, I don't know, you know, I don't know what to call them. People, spirits, beings. I mean, I don't know what to call them because those words mean different things to different people. And I, I don't know. 
but I know that they were there for me. They were there to greet me and love me and welcome me. And, and they were so overjoyed to welcome me home. I knew that I was home. I had this overwhelming feeling of being where I really belonged. Now, where we all really belong, our true home. And I knew that they had known me and loved me as long as I've existed. And they had been really important in my life story. Everyone always asks if I recognized them, of course. And I didn't because, as I said earlier, I had not personally known anyone who died. And so I wouldn't recognize a grandparent who died before I was born. I'm sure that later on I would have figured out what the relationship was, but I knew that they had been important in my life story. And I knew that I had loved them and valued them. And um, I don't know, I mean, I could start crying because it was so, so joyous. I mean, it really, um, everything was infused with such a purity of love. And I hate to even use that word because, you know, in English, we have one word for love, basically. You know, I love my husband and I also love pizza. I mean, how, you know, how does that work? <laughs> this is a love that that is all of the descriptors of love that you can imagine all balled into one. It's the heart of everything. It's the essence of everything. I mean, the people who greeted me were wearing these pearlescent robes that were woven together with fibers of love. And I know that, you know, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> it sounds crazy in our language, but but that's really what it was. And And the beauty was what spoke directly to me. It, it was this wonderful example of how God promises and indeed knows each and every one of us, knows every hair on our head, knows what speaks to us. What speaks beauty into my soul is color and the delicacy of flowers and the aromas of flowers. And, and that's what I saw. You know, beautiful music doesn't speak to me. Beautiful music speaks to other people. <laughs> and that's one of the things that I personally really appreciate about near-death experiences or after-death experiences or even other profound spiritual experiences. You know, as one person, I've heard uh, thousands of people's experiences. And we all describe incredible beauty. But the details are a little different. And personally, I think that speaks to the truth of these experiences, because just like on earth, you know, my husband just is passionately moved by music. And that's not me. He's not passionately moved by, by color, for example, but I am. I mean, just as we're both different here on earth, we are both different in heaven. And so that, that's what I experienced and that, that's what drew me home. And then I was taken down this uh, pathway and that's sort of a whole nother experience. And I, I was taken down to this threshold of this uh, great dome structure of sorts. I, I don't know how to describe it really. Uh, and I was there for what seemed like many hours. And while I was there, I had this complete understanding of not the divine nature of the universe, but certainly the divine order. I understood how it all worked. You know, how, how can it actually be possible for the God of the universe <laughs> to know thoroughly, completely know each and every one of the billions of us on this planet, love each and every one of us as though we're the only one, <laughs> have a plan for each and every one of our lives that's one of beauty and for the world. I mean, how can those things be possible when it's hard enough to know the people in our, you know, in our own neighborhood and it's even harder to love them? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it, it's a tough thing to try to imagine that. 
Uh, and I don't think it's possible, but I can tell you that it's true. One of the things that makes it difficult for us is that God's world is different in terms of time, dimension. Uh, you know, it's not like our world. Everything, a, a thousand, a million, an infinity number of things can happen simultaneously. And you can experience each thing simultaneously. You know, I don't think that, for example, um, we don't exist here on earth and God's world is over here. We exist within the spiritual realm. Um, it's a different, I, I, I never really know how to explain it. And I don't have a good analogy, um, but we exist within that world and we see only parts of that world. Um, but anyway, so I was on this threshold and understood everything. <laughs> I mean, all I had to do was think about something and I understood how it worked. Uh, and then at a certain point, um, I was told that it wasn't my time, that I had more work to do on earth and that I had to go back to my body. And I told you earlier that I am a self-confident, self-reliant person. And I, I'd been reassured by Jesus Christ that my husband and my kids would be fine. So I said, no, 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 I can stay. I'm, I'm good. I can stay. Um, but, you know, obviously I'm here. So at, at that point in time, I was given basically a laundry list of work yet to be done, things that I still needed to do. And I have to say that nothing on this list was something I looked forward to. Nothing on the list was something and I thought, oh, well, that will be really fun. And I, I'm looking forward to that. Everything on this list was something that was going to push me out of my comfort zone and challenge me in one way or another, which makes sense if you think about what God has planned for us because we're never really called to do things that we think we can do <laughs> or that we think we have time to do. We are called. And if we step forward, our talents, our time, our whatever it is, tends to appear. And so I think that God almost always calls us to move out of our comfort zone. And everything on this list certainly was going to do that. And certainly uh, the most challenging thing on that list had to do with being told about the coming and unexpected death of my oldest son, who at the time was only nine, healthy. I mean, there was no reason to imagine that he wouldn't live a long, productive life. And I asked the obvious question of why, you know, why, why my son? And when I asked that, it was immediately taken back to my life review in which I had been shown again and again and again, the truth in God's promise that beauty does come of all things. And I was reminded that it is always a matter of trust. Either you trust God's many promises to us or you don't. And that is a day by day, moment by moment choice. And with that, then I was taken back down this pathway and taken back to my body and reunited with my body. And then, you know, the following couple of weeks were just filled with tangible miracles. I mean, I had been underwater for 30 minutes. I mean, you know, no oxygen for 30 minutes does not, uh, does not bode well. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were in the middle of nowhere. And even if you administer CPR, the survival after 12 minutes is zero. I mean, it's just zero. And the survival without significant brain damage is really just not, not possible outside of God's presence. You died for 30 minutes. I mean, yes, I was dead. I, I watched my 
body being pulled ashore. And I can assure you, it was blue and purple and bloated. And, and there were witnesses. Right. The people who resuscitated me are the very first people who would say that, yes, they did something in that they were the hands and feet that provided the CPR, but they are the first people to say that, no, let's make no mistake. This was God's choice, period, that they had nothing to do with it. They did not rescue me. They did not pull me from the kayak. They did not do any of that. And they were witness to subsequent miracles. I mean, you know, there were, this was a very, very inaccessible part of Southern Chile. I mean, you can't get to this part of the river unless you come in a boat. And when they looked up after I started breathing again, they were sort of looking up, trying to think, okay, what now, what are we going to do? And there were two, you know, a couple of Chilean guys who just were there on the river bank. I mean, they weren't wearing river clothes. They didn't have boats. There's no, they shouldn't be there. <laughs> and they never said anything. They just came over and helped put my body on top of a boat because my legs were broken and, you know, I, was, I wasn't in very good shape. And they, along with a couple of my friends, carried me up this hillside and the hillsides are very steep, very thickly covered in bamboo. It was a, it was a big process. And eventually we emerged onto this dirt road and exactly right there on the dirt road was an ambulance, which just doesn't exist in this part of Chile. And in, in 1999, it really didn't exist. And, you know, we didn't have sat phones or cell phones or any means of communication. It's not like, you know, someone called for help. We, it didn't work that way. And again, this ambulance driver, um, you know, he never said anything. He just calmly walked over. I mean, it, it's so uh, against any normal behavior. I mean, anyone who has ever been in any sort of healthcare knows the very first thing you do, even if you're not a healthcare provider, if you just come upon something, you go, oh my gosh, what happened? What's going on? I mean, I look bad. In fact, I'm sure that the people who resuscitated me didn't look so good either. Uh, but this little guy kind of just calmly walked over and started loading me into the back of the ambulance. And when one of my friends just sort of incredulous, incredulously looked at him and said, you know, what are you doing here? Uh, the guy just sort of calmly looked at him and said, waiting. I mean, it's, there are so many things like that. And then, you know, they all disappeared. I mean, they, they didn't actually exist. They were never found later on. I mean, they didn't exist. So there are all kinds of things like this that are just straight up tangible miracles that more than just one person witnessed. God is love and love comes from God. In 1 John, the Bible tells us that God is not only all loving, but that He actually is love itself. The heart of the Parent Compass television show is to bring the transforming love of God to families everywhere. In every Parent Compass episode, true stories reveal family struggles and how their lives were radically changed by the love of God. Parent Compass, an award-winning television series, is completely funded by people like you. If you have been touched by God and you want to share God's love to others, would you please pass it on? Jesus tells us to go into all the world and to tell about Him. With your donation, you allow us to take this television show into many different nations and in many different languages, free of charge. And a portion of your donation goes to Parent Compass Outreach to feed starving children. Your gift does so much. To make your tax-deductible gift, go to parentcompass.tv forward slash donate. That's parentcompass.tv 
forward slash donate. And thank you for sending love and hope around the world.